Hello, Nelson. Welcome and thank you very much for joining me on my channel today. Matt, nice meeting you. Let's get started. And I would want to ask you if you can take me on an expedition through the chapters of your life and share a little bit of your story in terms of your experience in general. Matt, I've had one of the most complicated lives of anyone that I have met because at the age of five, I decided I wanted to be a lawyer and I never considered anything else. Uh, so that, that made my life very uncomplicated because I always knew what the path ahead was, which was college, then law school, and then practicing law. Eventually I became a judge, uh, but I never had any doubt about what I wanted to do. I always knew what I wanted to do. So that, and, and that made my life easy. Uh, I also knew that I loved history and wanted to write. And when I got the right opportunity, uh, you know, I wrote and have written half a dozen books uh, over the past 20 years. Okay. You've got one particular book that shines probably above all the others you've written. New York Times bestseller that uh, inspired also a HBO series. Can you tell me about this? How... Yeah, how did you get started writing this book and how did it get in front of someone in the movie industry to to actually shoot a series out of it with actually famous actors? That's a long story, so I'll condense it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I represented the planning board in Atlantic City when a lot of the original casinos were being planned and approved. And within about six months of being in City Hall, I had two conclusions. One, the place was corrupt as hell, but I knew I could deal with that simply by staying away from it. And if somebody asked me to do something I didn't like, I could just quit. So, so the corruption didn't bother me. I just worked around it. But I also was concerned by how dysfunctional the place was in terms of you know people not being able to get things done. Why is this? Uh, and so my, I sought refuge in the library, and I had the good fortune of meeting two women who understood the town's history. They fed me books for about a year and a half. Uh, I read about 15, 16, 17 different books, and I came away with the conclusion that nobody had ever gotten the story right. And so I needed to write the history of Atlantic City. Uh, I became a little obsessed with it. Uh, fortunately, I had a very understanding wife who, who went along for the crazy ride. Uh, and what drove the agenda for me was the character in the book and a real person, Enoch Nucky Johnson. No relation. I, I wish he was, because I'd have more good stories if he was. But that became the character that Steve Buscemi portrayed uh, in the HBO series. And... I knew from the first time I understood what Nucky's career was about. I said to my wife, this is a movie. Uh, I knew it was film and I didn't think of a TV series. I thought of a movie. And when HBO got their hands on the book, they said, this is a TV series. So TV series really is better than a movie uh, you know, in terms of what it can do for a book. And it was a real adventure. Uh, we met a lot of interesting people, very positive experience. HBO is a real class act. Uh, and their replica of the boardwalk and, and the replica of various rooms and suites and restaurants uh, was fascinating because they, they really do believe in authenticity. Uh, and so it was a it was a grand adventure. It, it really was. Uh, and we made some, you know, some really good acquaintances in the process. Okay. Did you actually take part and uh, were you on the set of the shooting? Did you meet the actors or you threw that book on the, someone's desk? They've read it, they've written a script, and then you said, okay, I'm happy with this, and that's it. <laughs> or no, did you man, actually get involved in, in the process in a way? Uh, we got involved in the process in two ways. One, observing what was going on. We went we went to you know various scenes being filmed, various shows being filmed. And that was a lot of fun. Met a lot of interesting people. 
had no idea just how labor intensive the film industry is, all the people that you know are involved in making it happen. Uh, and the only time they would consult me, because the book is the book and the show is the show, but the only time they would consult me was when they were worried about doing something that would be historically inaccurate. They wanted to ensure that they wrote historically accurate fiction, and they did. A lot of the things that they portrayed as happening did happen. A lot of the a lot of the situations that arose in the history of organized crime did happen. But every now and then they would call me, and there, and, and I know there'd be you know like a half a dozen people sitting around a table, and they say we're trying to do this, and I would say no, you can't do that because to any serious historian you're going to look stupid. You know, and 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 what and when they catch you in making mistakes like that, then you then you start getting criticisms that you know uh, can I won't say be fatal, but criticisms that are hurt. And so they would only rely upon me to make sure they didn't you know drive off the road into a ditch, uh, so that they didn't say or do something that was inaccurate or impossible. That was that was the role <laughs> that I played, and it was okay. It was fun. I'm, I'm okay, sure. could you give me an overview of your childhood or teenagers' experiences? How was it for oh. you growing up in your well, times? My, 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 my teenage experience uh, wasn't. I, I had a wonderful relationship with my mother. My mother, I tell people, and I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna tell you her history. But my mother was like one in a million, and I was lucky that she was my mother. She was an exceptional person. Uh, I had three siblings, uh, got along with them well. Uh, I had no relationship, let's put it this way, not much of a relationship with my father. Uh, He died uh, when I was 20. Um, We were barely on, you know, barely talking in terms of uh, getting along, just didn't get along very well at all. Uh, But I did have an emotional father, a gentleman who I remain close with. You know, from the time I left high school and went to college until the time he passed away was about 30 years and was sort of paralleled my mother too. You know, they, they, I really did have a very strong emotional mother and a very strong emotional father. Uh, I think of both of them to this day. He was my high school football coach, athletic coach, uh, my mom was just this amazing person who was who was orphaned very young. Uh, I mean, totally orphaned, very young, uh, and overcame it all, and was very well self educated, and was determined that her son was going to be properly educated because I was the only one of the three who really wanted, you know, to get a serious education and a serious profession. So she, you know, she, her attitude was, whatever we have to do to get it done, and we will get it done. Uh, and so a day doesn't go by that I don't think of her guidance. Uh, and the same thing is true of my emotional father, a gentleman named Edward Cardner. He, he, to this day, you know, I think of him very frequently. So I was fortunate. I had two mature, intelligent, well-educated people who gave me guidance. Uh, lots of times when I, when I didn't ask for it, I, it was it was there. Uh, you know, one would give me guidance. My mother would give me guidance by asking questions. Very, you know, almost like the Socratic method, Uh, not making statements, just, you know, asking questions that would make me uncomfortable. Uh, My emotional father, uh, he would, you know, he would pound things into me, you know, like you got to do it this way and don't do it that way. Uh, To this day, I have a regimen of physical activity because of him. He said, you must do something physical every day. So I start every morning with about a 45 to 60 minute workout uh, because he insisted that. So it's in my head that I have to do it. Uh, and with my mother, it was reading, you know, that, you know, you got to be reading something new all the time. Uh, so between the two of them, you know, I got a, a pretty balanced, pretty balanced existence in terms of, you know, trying to be well-rounded. Okay. So you developed two really good habits that had a positive impact on your life, reading and exercising which is quite challenging for a lot of people these days because some people don't have the motivation to exercise and the other people don't have maybe the time to read books. So a very good uh, set of skills to acquire. But but it's about habits. 
I have a habit of working out every morning, followed by reading something. And sometimes I wind up reading it because I wake up and I know I need to read this and, and think about it. Something I wrote, I edited it or whatever. Uh, and then I work out. But but my first two, three hours every day are pretty much reading, writing, and exercising. It, but it is about self-discipline and, and habits. Uh, there isn't anything special about it. It really isn't. You have to be very strong in your mind uh, to achieve these things. So be consistent. And it's very hard for people probably to to develop that strength in their mind to do certain things. So it's not only about exercising or reading, but getting rid of bad habits or in general things. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you another question. If someone wanted to pursue a career as a judge or going into that field, would you have any career advice for individuals how to root into that path what to look at and where to acquire the skill sets or connections to progress in that career. Obviously you have to have a degree. No one is going to become a judge, you know, just spontaneously because they want to, but any other tips that you could share, for example? Yes. I think the most important thing that anyone pursuing a career in the professions, and then and I also would add this to Anyone who is serious about excelling in their career needs to look for role models. Whether whether you're a, a lawyer or you're you're a physician or you're a you know a, a TV broadcaster, who are the role models that you think set the standard for the career that you wish to pursue? And if you emulate the conduct of those role models, you will eventually become a role model yourself. But it really is about here's what I have here's what I have learned, Matt. It's the rare successful person who is contacted by a new young, eager, interested person and asks, you know, how did you do that? And 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 What, what, how did you come to the you know, thought process of getting that done? It's a rare person that's going to be rude and say, I'm not talking to you. I mean, we have, we have connected online through, through LinkedIn. I have connected with several thousand people online and I've, some of them, you know, have been around this business longer than I have. And I ask them questions and then I have people asking me questions and it, it you have to overcome the, the fear or the inhibition of reaching out to a complete stranger. But if you reach out to a successful stranger, more often than not, they're going to let you pick their brain because, because they're, they're going to be, you know, they're going to, they're going to feel like, Oh, I really am being noticed by somebody who matters, somebody else in my profession. And so they'll be, they'll be honored by it. They won't be, they won't be put off by it. And the ones that are put off by it, they're not worth talking to anyway. Okay. You ever hear the Yiddish term mensch? Yes. Is it as a Yiddish term mensch, which means a person who really doesn't know how to do the wrong thing. It's a person who, When you interact with them, they're always honorable. Uh, I can't tell you that I am always a mensch, but I try very hard to be a mensch. And most successful people will share their knowledge with you, but you have to overcome the fear and inhibition of reaching out. Uh, and you'll be surprised. I mean, I've had so many, I've had so many people help me along the way that the only way I can repay them is to pay it forward to younger people now. And, and I, Try to do that a lot. Okay. Could you share a piece of advice you received throughout your life that stuck with you? And what would you say? Why did it stuck with you? Through watching various people and through talking and having serious discussions with various people, I have learned that you do not have to be the top dog, so to speak, you know, the, 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 the most powerful person in the room 
in order to be a leader. I say to people, what is a leader? A leader is someone who cannot be ignored. I've been part of many organizations. As a lawyer, I represented many organizations. And I was oftentimes was surprised by the people that the decision makers would reach out to because they said, hmm, we know he's qualified in this area. We know he has some expertise. We know that she has really got her act together and you know can give us information, even though she or he may not be you know the top person. They are a leader because we can't ignore them as we go forward in our decision making process. We need to consult with that person, and so I say to every young professional, regardless of what the profession is, study your career field study the role models in your career field and it won't be long before people will be coming to you as a leader in your career but it does it does take persistence and it does take diligence okay looking at your life you had a very exciting career and also interest you in history speaking, writing books, being a judge. Is there a moment you wish you could go back in time and do things differently? Or were you quite happy how things progressed, evolved, and happened in your life? Well, there's always things that you look back and say, I could have done that better. Uh, I've, 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 had, I've had some relationships that i mean i had a relationship that i had it, it was a lawyer that i was a partner with and i sort of had some doubts but you know he sang the right song it, it was we were part of a bigger organization i i brought him into it and boy did he create a problem in my life okay and created a very big problem uh financial problem for me and and you know i overcame it and again i had I had a very understanding patient wife uh who you know we worked through it together uh her instincts told me that i shouldn't be doing business with them but i did anyway and i made a mistake uh, so there are things i could do over some sometimes business relationships you have to be real careful as you you know it is this person an honorable person that you know you can rely upon all the time I'll be candid. I should have had stronger doubts. Uh, there's no point in mentioning names, but you know, there was like a, this huge pothole in my life that my wife and I had to figure out how to get through it because we had three children uh, that we had to educate, uh, and so we got through it. But it was a, it was a serious financial struggle for for a fair number of years. But that's all. You know, that's behind me. It's about it's about you know it's about persistence. A lot of a lot of things. You know, you simply have to work at. And I say to people, what's your option? You're going to walk away and be a failure. If you're committed to something, you have to stay at it. Okay. And what would you say is the most difficult part of being a judge? Oh, my goodness. It's a very, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, that, see, I, I used to tell people, and I did this regularly, I do not judge people. I judge facts and apply the law to the facts and you know look not everybody can win uh and lots of times the results are painful for people uh and i, I was involved in a case that impacted the lives of thousands of people it was a pharmaceutical claim uh and i just wasn't convinced that the evidence was there the scientific evidence was there to support the claim uh after you know, a couple week long hearing and after a couple months of preparing for it and then another month you know writing my decision you know i had to i had to say thumbs down to a very large claim involving a large number of people and i don't even like the pharmaceutical industry okay but you have to <laughs> yes you know, so sometimes in the law you have to do what the facts and the law dictate and so there are occasions as a judge when I really struggled getting, so to speak, you know, to the finish line and, and 
uh, on that particular occasion, I had I had the appellate court overrule me and tell me I got it wrong. And then I had the Supreme Court, which was the highest court uh, in New Jersey, tell me mm, he got it right. And so I, so I ultimately my reasoning uh, and the facts vindicated me. Uh, but it can be it can be it, it's very challenging. And sometimes uh, I tried never to lose sleep over anything and I routinely do not but and you may you may have found this in your life already there will be some things that they are the last thing you think about before you go to sleep and they are the first thing you think of when you eyes woke, wake up in the morning there are some things that get that you know so deep into your system that they just take over your life until <laughs> until it's over. Yeah, you know, and I've I've had that situation in my life, both as a lawyer and a judge, where for days, weeks, you become a living part of that problem, and you just stay with it. Your your attention has to just stay focused on it. You have to get everything else out of the way, and you have to stay with it because. When you permit yourself to get distracted, you're just wasting time. You have when you have a serious problem, everything else gets out of the way, and you must focus on that serious problem. Uh, and I don't care what profession you are in; uh, it's the same way. When you know you have something that's important to your career and important to the people around you, you must work at it until you get it resolved. And I had to do that many times as a lawyer and I had to do it many times as a judge which is get everything else out of the way let's focus on this one thing and then we can go back to business as normal so don't spread yourself too thin is what I say to people when you have it when you have a challenging problem in your career focus on it get it resolved and then go back to spreading yourself thin okay mm, I'm jumping here with questions randomly as they come through my head but when I listen to you, then I I think the next question might be more applicable. So what would you say do you think is a key to a fulfilling and successful life? Every I, I believe everybody needs somebody. Everybody needs another person in their life that they know they can confide in without restrictions that they know will be there to support them when things go off the tracks, so to speak, and someone who also needs you. And so I was fortunate. I found that relationship with my wife, Joanna, uh, and I do know, and she knows, it, we, we went through a, a rough period in our, in our, in our lives together, uh, and we were separated for a while. And we got back together. It was the best decision we made for each other, the best decision we made for our family. But here's what I know. I have written six books. The first one would never have gotten written if it wasn't for the stability that came back into my life when the two of us got together. Uh, she at the time uh, was a classroom teacher. When we got back together, she continued her education. She earned her doctorate. The two of us made possible what the other could not have done on their own uh, and and so i say everybody needs somebody and and that doesn't mean you know you have to have a wife you have to have a husband uh or you have to have a you know a spouse but you, everybody needs somebody in their life who you know you can trust and who you know is going to give you straight advice i i had a that i had a lawyer that i first started practicing law with a gentleman named john bertman I dedicated one of my books to him. And as a lawyer, I knew I could always go to him. There were some personal problems I couldn't take to him because I just didn't think he'd be the, he'd give me the, you know, the advice that I needed. But as a lawyer, I knew I, I could count on him. And in my life, I know that I can count upon my wife and she knows she can count on me. And, and each one of our careers was enabled by the other. Uh, so what's the most important thing? To find that person in your life who you know is you know is it as interested in your problems as you are, but you have to be interested in their problems too. And you have to you have to work 
together as a team. And again, whether it's husband and wife or wife and wife and husband and husband, none of that matters. Everybody needs somebody. And I have noticed over my life people who were sort of isolated because they just didn't find the other person that they fitted with properly. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what, when I see that it's disappointing because they, they're not, they're not having fulfilled themselves the way they could have if they didn't have, you know, the right person. And I lucked out. I mean, I really did. Uh, a wonderful woman who's brilliant, wise, and who supports me in everything that I do and isn't afraid to be my critic and I'm not afraid to be her critic. Uh, so, you know, What's the what's the first thing I would look at for success is, you know, knowing that you have that port in the storm, knowing that you have that person that you can rely upon. All the, that really does make things easier. It, it, it really does. Uh, doing things all by yourself. It's hard. But again, that doesn't that doesn't mean you should not seek out mentors because they're most people who are successful in their career will take time to mentor you if you only ask them to. Because once you ask them, they're feeling that you they have been honored. I, I, I get requests from young lawyers all the time. I'm thrilled that they that they want to pick my brain. And then maybe it's just one subject that I can help them with. Uh, but I make myself available because I had so many good mentors who made themselves available to me. Okay, that's some really good advice here. What would you say is the biggest challenge facing younger generations today and how could they overcome it? You did mention a lot of times uh, getting a mentor for career advice or, you know, professional advice. But what challenges are currently present in our environment that's facing younger people? And what would you say could be done to overcome it how they could overcome it or what could maybe the society do to help younger people social media really has at least in the at least in you know in western the western world which includes europe and the united states and a lot of other countries social media has too big of a footprint i'm not saying that we don't need social media i'm saying that there are situations in which social media sort of takes you know sucks all the air out of the room and dominates you know the discussion and prevents people from learning the way they ought to be learning uh i mean i i do know that you know there's a serious decline in people's attention spans for reading now i also know that people's attention spans are being overwhelmed they're being you know, from the moment we get we wake up until the time we go to bed, you know, there are someone, something that's pitching us, trying to get us to buy something, trying to get our attention. And I didn't have that problem 50 years ago. Uh, you know, I could find, I could find solitude a lot easier than my children and my grandchildren can find solitude. I could, I, I was able to find it very easily. I could just Go in the library, take a book off the shelf, and nobody was bothering me. In today's world, you got the phone, you got your computer. And I'm not saying those aren't valuable devices, because they are. But when people get too connected, then my question is, do they have any roots anywhere? Because they're they're spread so they're spread so thin in so many different directions. Uh they they forget that they really need roots. And so Young people today, I think, uh, risk getting distracted from what's their purpose in life, what's the role they want to play in society, uh, who do they want to bond with, uh, because there's so many things coming at them constantly. Uh, it's it's not a you know it's 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 a more difficult environment in which to grow as a professional today. Than it was when I had had the opportunity as a young person, and so I guess I guess you know my biggest advice would be is to take stock of how you're spending your time. Uh, and I'm not saying you got to be opening opening up a book every morning. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying 
Do you make time for face-to-face conversations with the people that are important to you? Do you make time to develop a little bit of expertise in a portion of your career that matters to you and, and that matters to other people? Because the more knowledge you are, and, and, and there's a whole lot of difference between information and knowledge. Uh, we create knowledge through the information that we receive. But the more knowledge that a young person that she or he can create in their career, the more valuable they're going to be over the long haul, whether whether it's an IT person or a classroom school teacher or a lawyer on his feet in a courtroom uh, or, or a doctor looking after a patient. The more knowledge in your career field, the more respected you will be and the more value you will have. When I say value, uh, I'm not talking about becoming rich. People can, people become wealthy in all sorts of in all sorts of ways. When I'm saying value, you become a leader because people recognize that you cannot be ignored. And I'm worried with all of the you know craziness that's you know on social media. You know, a lot of a lot of talent that because it hasn't been properly groomed is being ignored. Uh, and so I encourage people to carve out a place for themselves that they're comfortable with the knowledge, that the knowledge that they're creating has value, uh, and then begin, you know, making your way in life, in whatever the career may be. Now, don't see, and here's the thing. As you get older and people ask you to mentor them, what I have learned repeatedly is that I learn too. It, you know, one of the best parts, and I've taught, I've taught classes in law school and I've taught classes in college, uh, and, and I have one-to-one mentoring sessions with people on the phone. But what I learn too, when, when you when when you when you share your knowledge with other people, it's amazing how much you learn in the process. And so, you know, dedicate your life to learning, and and try to spread away some of the noise and some of the nonsense that's coming to us from the from the internet. Uh, I mean, I, I'm thrilled that you're doing what you're doing. I think it's I think it's a great idea, and I told you that in, in our exchanges. Uh, you. you're, you're giving you're you're giving young people an opportunity to hear from experienced people on what were some of the paths that they took that that helped get them to success. Uh, and and so you are enabling me and you as well. We are mentoring anybody that will eventually listen to this. But what I know, Matt, is this is valuable, what what you're doing. It's very valuable. It has value in our society, and I applaud you for it. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. Do you think we are too far down the line that the government or the society could influence or limit or have an impact on kind of limiting how social media is actually taking over our life and now artificial intelligence. Do you think the government, society, anyone could still have an impact on safe or influence in our way, the younger generations? I'm, I'm worried that our elected officials and, and, you know, people, Aristotle said a lot of years ago, people get the government they deserve. And at the end of the day, we do. But Aristotle wasn't able to predict social media and the Internet and people from all over the world being connected. And I think there has to be some sort of mechanism. And I'm and I have lots of thought, thoughts on this. Uh, this the, the European Union seems to be going after it better than we are in this country. But what disturbs me most about social media is that people will say things about you and to you that they would never say if they were face to face to you in the same room. And that's what that's what I find disturbing is that there are many, many comments on social media that take your pick. They're hurtful, they're they're misleading, they're they're childish, they're, you know, uh ignorant and harmful and if that person was in the same room with you sitting seated across from the table they wouldn't say those things to you and so that that's part of my problem with social media is that there's a lot of things being aired 
that wouldn't be if people were forced to face one another. Uh, I, you know, it, social media is a real challenge for young people. Uh, and, and, and I'm a big believer in whether you call it limiting screen time or whatever. I'm a big believer in, in, in people you know, finding other interests besides social media and, 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 and dedicating time to that interest, whether it could be art, could be music, could be, could be, you know, it could be history, law, journalism, because you're, you're a journalist. Uh, that, that's the role you're playing now. And it's an important role. I worked with journalists for 20 years. I represented the daily newspaper during, during my 31 years of practice. 20 of those years were with newspaper people. Newspaper people fascinate the hell out of me. Teen minds. Uh, and so social media is, is, uh, is, has the potential to be, and it is a positive force, but it's also a distraction for too many people. Okay, some, some good thoughts here. Apart from your wonderful books you've written, I didn't have a chance to read them, but I'm definitely gonna order uh, at least one book from you, because I'm truly uh, intrigued, especially the one that uh, got turned into a TV series. Is there a book you've read in your life that you think you would recommend to someone else to read that had some inspiration, yes. a good storyline, anything? Well, well, I, I'm, I'm look, see if I can get my hands on it right now. But I always <laughs> have it pretty handy. It's written by a historian from Cambridge, um, and the title of it is, is Europe Between the Oceans. It's an extraordinary book that really puts Western civilization into context that makes where we are, the, whether it's the English-speaking world or the, you know, the Germanic languages or the, or the Roman, Romance languages, we, we, we all came out of uh, Europe. And he discusses what he calls Europe between the oceans. I think it's like uh, 500 B.C. to 1500 A.D. And he, he really grounds you, is what I'm saying, in understanding how our society came to be. Now, that book was written you know, long before the Internet had taken hold. The Internet existed at the time. Uh, and I just realized the book is not in my writing studio. Uh, shame on me. But it's, it's Europe, Europe Between the Oceans. Just check it out. And I'm, telling, I'm not telling you to go out and buy it. That's up to you. Uh, but check it out because it's a fascinating read in terms of you know grounding you in Western civilization. He's a he's a he's a not only not only a serious scholar, but he's a good writer too. The book reads well. Okay, so there's you. one book that would be the book that I would, <laughs> I would recommend. That I apologize for not being able to give it the author's name. It, it's not in, it's not in this room. Okay, let's move to the final question. You've shared a lot of um, stories, wisdom. Mm, guidance final words of wisdom that you would want to pass to the younger generation anything else apart from what you've already said or shared well it, it, it and I'm trying to remember the play but it comes from Shakespeare to thine own self be true know, know that at the end of the day you can look in the mirror and say I haven't deceived anyone. I haven't lied to anyone. I haven't taken advantage of anyone. Uh, I, I've lived. You be. You need to be able to live each day that when you go to bed, you don't have any, you know, misgivings about having mistreated somebody. Uh, no, to thine own self be true, because because we ought to be our most severe critics. Uh, but when you find that other right person, then the two of you together become critics and mentors and you know molders of each other's personality everybody does need somebody but if one word of advice to thine own self be true and i'm trying to remember which which play it is in shakespeare um which i do not recall right now but i will find it okay nelson i wanted to thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me today i truly appreciate it for sharing your stories guidance and wisdom